much, Igor. Thanks for this uh, nice invitation. Um, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about surfaces of sections and application to hyperbolic rep dynamics and geodesic flows. And everything I will be talking about is joint work with Gonzalo Contreras from Guanajuato in Mexico. Oh. Ah, so, okay. So let me start by giving you the, the uh, setting and the definition. Perhaps I want to keep my watch. Sorry, so then I, I have a big idea of the time. So um, let me give you the setting and the basic, basic definitions. So uh, I will be working on a close contact three manifold N with its red flow, red vector field X and its red flow phi T. So I wrote here the definition of contact form and the definition of red flow. So a surface of section is a compact surface, sigma in the uh, post three manifold N, such that its boundary is tangent to the red vector field. So each component of the boundary is a closed orbit of the red vector field. And the interior is transverse to the red vector field X, like in this picture. Now, uh, very often surfaces of sections are required to be uh, embedding embedded in the closed three manifold. But for me, I will ask a little bit less. I will only require the interior to be embedded in the complement of the boundary, but I'm allowing the boundary to be a multiple cover. Each component of the boundary, I'm allowing it to be a multiple cover uh, of a closed rep, or rep orbit. Now, uh, more remarkable class of surfaces of sections are the global surfaces of sections, which satisfies satisfy this extra condition in orange. If you take any point on your closed three manifold, Z, and you flow it forward with the flow, with the rep flow for some time, capital T, say, you intersect your surface of section at some point. And you can even require, it's not that much more, uh, to have a uniform upper bound on this uh, time capital T needed to meet the surface again, it doesn't matter. So these are global surfaces of sections. And now let me give you uh, an intermediate notion in between just the plane surfaces of sections and the global ones. I'm gonna call them almost global surfaces of sections. So these are um, surfaces of sections such that they intersect every orbit of the red flow at least once. However, if you only take half orbits of the red flow, so take a point and you take the half orbits going outward in the future or in the past. It may be that some half orbits don't intersect uh, the surface of section anymore. And if they do so, it's because they are asymptotic to a connected component of the boundary. And in this case, uh, at least if the red flow is sufficiently generic, this component must be hyperbolic. The reason being that for generic red flow, uh, every rep orbit is either, every closed rep orbit is either hyperbolic or elliptic. And if it's elliptic, it's actually irrationally elliptic generically. And when you flow towards, when you converge towards an irrationally elliptic uh, orbit, it's already a bit strange, but if you do it, um, you keep winding around the closed orbits. And by doing so, you keep intersecting sigma. So this limit uh, of uh, no meeting orbits. I'm going to call this, this uh, hyperbolic closed orbits, which are limits of half orbits, um, the, the asymptotic boundary of sigma later on. All right, so these are the basic uh, definitions. I'm going to be I'm interested in their existence and then in applications of them. So as for the applications, um, let me just say that surfaces of sections are relevant in dynamics because they allow to reduce the study of uh, three-dimensional, say, rep dynamics, in this case, to the study of surface diffeomorphisms. And you do that by considering the return map. So you have your surface of section sigma, which you draw as a disk. You take a point, and you take the map that sends this point to the first point on the interior of sigma that you reach by flowing forward with the flow. Now, if the surface of section is global, um, this map that I just mentioned is uh, fully defined in the interior of sigma. In general, this map is only defined on an open subset because if it's defined in Z, 
it's defined around Z by transversality. And uh, Poincare recurrence uh, implies that uh, this open set U is non empty and indeed it's dense and even of full measure in the interior of sigma. This is because a uh, almost every point uh, in your three manifold is recurrent. And uh, second remark this return map, wherever it's defined, the open set where it's defined, it preserves the area form given by the differential of the contact form restricted to the surface of section, d lambda restricted to sigma. So for the experts, this is uh, even more so, this, this psi is actually an exact symplectomorphism. It has zero flux. And, but for this talk, it's only the only relevant thing would be the area preservation, preservation, which is crucial for the applications. Right, so we said, I'm interested in the existence of these objects. So let me give you a bit of history. So first, the notion of surface of section uh, goes back, as many of the notions in, in this business, to, to Poincaré um, in his work on uh, the restricted circular, circular restricted uh, three body problem. And since Poincaré's time, there, are, you know, there have been many results on existence and applications of surfaces of sections. Let me just mention three existence results, which are particularly relevant for today's talk. The first one is a spectacular result uh, due to Birkhoff in 1970, uh, which says that, uh, which, which so Birkhoff proved the existence of global surfaces of sections for Riemannian geodesic flows of closed surfaces, provided the curvature of the surface as a sign is either everywhere positive or everywhere negative. This is a great result with uh, uh, important applications, for instance, to the uh, existence of closed geodesics on spheres. Well, generalizations, these results have important applications to the existence of closed geodesics on spheres. And then a jump of 60 years I had from 1981, the year I was born. Um, and um, here's a result of David Fried, a former student of SMAIL prove the existence of global surfaces of sections for uh, transitive anosov flows. They don't even need to be uh, red flows, just anosov flows in dimension three that are transitive. They mean they have a, a dense orbit. If they are anosov red flows, they automatically are transitive. So, and finally, last result, which is one of the most famous results in symplectic dynamics, due to offer to skid sender, is the existence from 2003, but it's actually an extension of an earlier result from uh, 1998. It's the existence of global surfaces of sections uh, for the um, for the red flows on, on uh, convex three spheres, or more generally for the red flows of uh, well, non-degenerate convex three spheres, or more generally for the red flows of non-degenerate dynamically convex type three spheres. Right, so now, I want to state my results, but in order to do that, I need to introduce a little bit of terminology, um, which is more or less a classical terminology. So um, a red vector field on a closed three manifold, or actually on any closed manifold, also in higher dimension would be the same. It's called the Kupka smell when it satisfies the following two conditions. So usually in general dynamics, not just symplectic, uh, the first condition in Kupka smell requires all the closed orbits uh, to be hyperbolic. But if you only restrict yourself to rep dynamics, uh, the fact that all closed orbits are hyperbolic is not a generic property. Elliptic orbits, if they are non-degenerate, they survive under perturbation. And we would like this condition to be generic. So uh, usually in symplectic dynamics, Kupka's male means something weaker, which is, so first condition is all the closed orbits are non-degenerate, but possibly elliptic. And the second condition is the so-called Kupka's male transversality condition that says that for every pair of hyperbolic closed web orbit, orbits, gamma and zeta, possibly equal, uh, if they exist, uh, the stable manifold of gamma intersects transversely the unstable manifold of zeta. Namely, the intersection could be empty, but if it's not empty, it's still transverse. So in the picture here, I draw a drew gamma and zeta with a local transverse picture as two 
points. So you should imagine the red vector field coming from above. And uh, stable manifolds are black, unstable manifolds are, are orange, and the intersection points are these gray points. And you see that they're all transverse. And these are the heteroclinics. So this point, for instance, if you flow it backwards, you converge to gamma. If you flow forward, you converge to zero. I already anticipated the um, Kupka smell condition is generic. Namely, it holds for the red vector field of the C infinity generic uh, contact form on a closed three manifold. So, this is a classical result due to Robinson from the 1970s, I would say. And actually, Robinson was proving harder genericity results that hold for, um, um, for Hamiltonian systems on symplectic manifolds, but considering all energy levels at once. And there, there are more subtleties, but in particular, Robinson results uh, imply this. And if you are interested in geodesic, uh, geodesic flows or geodesic vector fields, which are my favorite class of, uh, of red flows, um, uh, you still have the genericity within the class. So the Kupka's condition holds for the geodesic vector field of a C infinity generic Riemannian metric on a closed surface, and also in higher dimension. And this was proved by Contreras, my collaborator, uh, together with Pater 9, Gabriel Pater 9, in the early years, 2000s, I believe. Right, so, so this is uh, the definition that I need for the theorem. And the theorem says that for this class of red dynamic or of red vector fields on close three manifolds, Kukas Mayo class, uh, there are always global surfaces of sections. And therefore, due to the genericity of the Kukas Mayo condition, global surfaces of sections exist generically. So they exist for the red vector field of a C infinity generic contact form on a close three manifold. And also, more specifically, uh, for the geodesic vector field of a C infinity generic Riemannian metric on a closed surface. So um, there's another alternative um, generic existence result for global surfaces of sections due to Colin Bernois, Renievich, and Reckman, which is independent of, uh, of mine, Gonzalo Contreras. And uh, the result is also slightly different. Both have the same corollary, the generic existence. The result says that uh, any non-degenerate red vector field in a closed three manifold admits a global surface of section, provided it has lots of closed orbits. So we know that it always has at least two closed orbits. Um, but here the requirement is that it has infinitely many closed orbits, and even more, they must be dense, and even more, they must be equidistributed. Meaning that if you take the contact volume form and you consider it as a measure, you can approximate it uh, in the weak star topology uh, by a sequence of measures supported by finite collections of closed orbits. So this tells you in particular closed orbits must be everywhere in the manifold, otherwise you wouldn't be able to approximate the volume form in some open set, for instance. All right, so this is um, the results. So stop me if you have questions, please. But... Sorry, can I ask a question? So can you very briefly compare with this Giroux open book uh, result? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, Giroux open book result doesn't fix the contact form. It fixes the contact distribution. So it's it's a completely different uh, different result, right? So here, so Giroux tells you. Right, who tells you that the contact distribution is supported by, uh, I forgot the terminology, but supported by, uh, um, uh, by an open block decomposition. And with the right uh, contact form, the red vector field will be transverse to the, transverse to the pages of the open block. So every page uh, will be a global surface of section. But, but uh, here we, are, uh, we have a given a red vector field. We don't have a given uh, contact distribution, we have more. And uh, it's also, this is an excellent question. So if you fix only the contact distribution, by varying the red vector field, you, you can have a very, very different type of dynamics so, uh, associated to the same contact distributions, right? So it's, it's really a completely different problem. Yeah, thanks for asking. 
So in the first part of the talk, I'd like to, let's see, it's we have 25 minutes have gone, right, roughly. And I know, uh, sorry, 15 minutes are gone. Good, I panicked for a little bit. So in the first part of the talk, uh, I would like in the remaining of the first part of the talk, I'd like to, I won't be able to prove this theorem, but I want to sketch at least the steps of the proof. And perhaps, sorry, I didn't finish uh, commenting uh, the results of Kolandorna Rinievich Reckman. So this condition of the closed orbit is very strong, but remarkably, it's also synthetically generic in the contact form due to the equidistribution theorem of, uh, of year year. It's a remarkable theorem of um, contact dynamics, dimension three. So as for the proof, let, let me give you the, the path. First, I need some preliminaries to get to the proof. And so, um, so I have my non-degenerate close contact free manifold. Later on, it will be Kupka's male, but for now it's just non-degenerate with its red flow. And uh, so um, surface of section for a red flow cannot be a closed surface. It must have boundary uh, due to uh, Stokes theorem. And uh, the boundary is a union of closed orbits. And therefore finding surfaces of sections is harder than finding closed orbits. Finding closed orbits of red flows is already not easy, but dimension three nowadays, we know many results. And actually the outcome uh, uh, as a byproduct of Michael Hutchings uh, embedded contact homology, um, you also have existence of plane surfaces of sections, not global, not almost global, but at least surfaces of sections. And indeed, um, embedded contact homology provides lots of surfaces of sections on a given closed free manifold. Indeed, it provides surfaces of sections going through any given generic point. Let's say it's not a precise statement, but you should imagine that you find plenty of surfaces of sections. So this is step one towards the towards the theorem, and then step two, which is also very important. So step one is hardware technology, embedded contact homology it needs holomorphic curves, it needs cyber written theory. And now another important step is step, is due to Kolandorna Reckman, three of the four authors that I mentioned before. Uh, so Kolandorna Reckman took uh, huge collections of uh, surfaces of sections provided by Yachings. And take this huge collection that somehow feel pretty much almost the all um, contact manifold. More precisely, they take a huge collection such that if you take a small flow box around each of the um, surfaces of sections that you took, you cover almost all, all the manifold. Now, with this huge collection of surfaces of sections, they so every each one of these surfaces of sections, if you wiggle it in its interior, still remains surface of section because transversality is open. And so they wiggle them so that they all intersect nice and transversely. And, and then they apply a surgery technique due to Freed. Uh, it was one of the ingredients of the result of Freed that I mentioned before, to resolve the self-intersections and the mutual intersections among this collection, among the elements of this collection of surfaces of sections. The free surgery is actually depicted in this picture. It's very simple, uh, but very powerful. So you have two surfaces, both are transverse to the same vector field. There's a unique way to resolve the sub-intersection and remain transverse. So as an outcome of this, with some work, they establish the existence of an almost global surface of section sigma. So once again, almost global is a surface of section such that Every, or, every full orbit intersects the surface of section at least once, but some half orbits don't intersect the surface of section, and they do so because they're asymptotic to some components, some hyperbolic components in the boundary. And let me fix the terminology and notation. I'm going to call these limits closed orbits in the boundary, the asymptotic boundary of sigma, and I'm going to denote it by partial infinity sigma. It's not standard notation. I made it up while pre preparing the slides but I think it was convenient for my talk. So obviously, if the asymptotic boundary of sigma is empty, then by its very de by definition of asymptotic boundary, sigma must be a global surface of section. Now, let me remark, Colando and Reckman do more than this. They actually construct this almost global surface of section, and they employ it to build what they call a broken box decomposition, 
which is a generalization of open book decompositions um, inspired with analogous property uh, to the finite energy than the to the finite energy foliations of open resource skin sender, but broken books are less rigid. Um, they're not the leaf of this, so they give a foliation, singular foliation of your close contact three manifold, whose leaves are almost uh, are surfaces of sections, but they're not projections of holomorphic curves anymore in the simplectization, unlike, um, unlike the needs of finite energy foliations. All right, so this was step two. And uh, now, um, the idea to go from almost global to global would be to start with this almost global surface of section provided by this theorem and simplify it by using, uh, again, uh, surgery techniques and uh, um, simplify, simplify the, maybe do some operation that uh, gets rid of some uh, components in the asymptotic boundary. So do some operation to produce new almost global surfaces of sections with smaller and smaller asymptotic boundary and eventually a global surface of section. Now, in order to do this, I extract two uh, arguments from the proof of Klanderna Reckman. And the first one is the following. So once again, I'm in my setting, I have a non-degenerate close contact free manifold and an almost global surface of section. So can I ask a question before we move on? So how do you, how do they go from a, like, when you do surgery, how, why do you, uh, why are you able to make things uh, almost global? Yeah, because they do surgery. Yes, because they don't just do surgery between, I mean, they do surgery uh, within a huge collection, of surfaces of sections that feel pretty much almost the old manifold, or at least feel it if you thicken them a little bit. And it's not, I mean, this is a theorem, it's not, uh, I didn't pretend to prove the theorem, and, and, but, uh, yeah, but it's not constructive, right? You have to kind of. It is constructive. I mean, it's not okay. what's constructive is the given is the fact that you are given this huge collection. You don't know what it looks like, but you don't know that it's huge. You don't know that the flow. You, you know, for instance, that the small flow boxes around all these surfaces of sections together almost feel almost the old manifold. Okay. It's it's a theorem. It's not. I don't pretend to prove it just one sentence, of course. But um, yeah, but it, it requires the fact that you have a huge collection of sources of sections to start with. And in a sense, if you are if you have another tool to produce many surfaces of sections, and for instance, other tool than embedded contact homology, you could use that other tool and have a proof that it's fully independent from, say, ECH or homomorphic curves. It is the case, for instance, for uh, closed geodesics. For geodesic flows, um, together with Gonzalo and Gera Knieper and Benjamin Schultz, we have Riemannian arguments based on the curve shortening flow. More questions? Okay, so um, let's see how do we go with time. So, um, yeah, so first, the step to go from almost global to global is an argument is this argument that I extract from what I just explained actually from Colander and Reckman. So you have your almost global surface of section sigma and assume that you're able to find another surface of section, call it epsilon. In this picture here, it's a disk such that it intersects. So such that its boundary doesn't intersect the boundary of your almost global surface of section and its interior intersects some component of the asymptotic boundary of the almost global surface of section. Now, if you do this, you can take, you can do a free surgery between the almost global surface of section and this new surface of section. So this is not a connected sum. I use a connected sum symbol, but I mean the surgery that I indicated before, that I, that I depicted, that I described before. So if you do this surgery, you obtain a new almost global surface of section. And now in this almost global surface of section, gamma doesn't belong anymore to the asymptotic boundary. The reason being that when you converge to gamma, you keep intersecting epsilon, and therefore you keep intersecting the new surface of section. So this is the first ingredient, but of course you have to be able to construct surfaces of sections, which is uh, which intersect gamma in this way, and that's that's not easy. But one way to do it is again 
by using by one way to do it would be to reduce the problem to the, uh, to, the um, to an existence problem for homoclinics by using this argument, which was employed by Colander and Ekman for their results. But it's actually an, an argument originally due to Fried that was employed to um, to prove uh, its existence result for animals of three-dimensional flows that I mentioned before. So the argument says that assume you have a component of this asymptotic boundary of your almost global surface of section that has plenty of homoclinics. So in particular, it has more precisely it has uh, well, it has transverse homoclinics in all separate traces. And I'm going to say in a moment what I mean by that. Transverse is the Kupka's mesh transversality that I gave before for these homoclinics. Well, so if you have a closed orbit, uh, if you have a component of the asymptotic boundary with uh, transverse homoclinics in all separate traces, then you're also able to find the surface of section. You're able to construct by hand, pretty much, a surface of section upsilon satisfying the requirement of the previous lemma. The boundary of upsilon doesn't intersect the boundary of sigma, and the interior of upsilon intersects um, this given component gamma. And the argument is beautiful. It's in, in, uh, and uh, it's actually, the proof is, is, is one picture. So first, let me specify what I mean by this condition, because it's important also for my result. So I'm drawing here the, um, the, the situation in a, in a local transverse picture. So my closed orbit gamma derived as a point with the vector field coming from above. And I'm drawing in black the stable manifold and in gray the unstable manifold of gamma. I remind you, gamma is hyperbolic. All these orbits are hyperbolic. Now, if you remove gamma from its stable manifold, you have locally two components, which are usually called the stable separatrices. And analogously, from, if you remove gamma from the unstable manifold, locally you have two components, which are called the unstable separatrices. Now, this condition, the, the lemma requires every uh, stable and unstable separatrix to contain a homoclinic, an intersection between unstable and stable manifold. So homoclinic, this point here, is a point that flown backwards converges to gamma and flow, and, and same is if we flow it forward in time. Now, if you have transverse homoclinics in all separatrices, um, you actually find a suitable horseshoe nearby, and you can do um, symbolic dynamics and detect close by to your original closed orbit gamma and other closed orbits intersecting this local transverse surface in the northeast sector. You find another closed orbit close to gamma, uh, but uh, southwest of gamma. And then you find a third closed orbit uh, coming northwest and coming back again southeast and then coming back again at the original point northwest. So in dimension three, the picture is this. And by hand, you can actually build a surface of section, which is actually a pair of pens. And I claim that if you stare at this picture long enough, you figure out how it goes. You, 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 fill the, you join the dots here. You have a square that's transverse to the vector field. And then you flow the boundary of this square with the flow, and you perturb it a little bit, you tilt it a little bit to have transversality. So it's, I, I, I don't pretend, uh, don't pretend you see it immediately, but if you stare at this picture, for say 15 minutes, you, you, would, you would see how it goes. Right, so now this is a recap of the two lemmas that I just mentioned. And in view of these two lemmas, in order to find a global surface of section, it remains to prove the following thing. Given an almost global surface of section, and given there is always some component of the asymptotic boundary having lots of homoclinics, having homoclinics in all separate traces. And this is what we prove, and we actually prove uh, more than this. So let's see. So, what we prove is the following. So, for now on, I'm going to assume the Kupka smear condition. I remind you, non degeneracy of the closed orbits as before, but also transversality of stable and unstable manifolds of the closed orbit orbits. Now I have my almost global surface of section, and the theorem says that 
if you take any component, any component of the asymptotic boundary, you look at it's a hyperbolic closed verb orbit, you look at its uh, stable and unstable manifolds. Uh, I already said that the Kupka's mechanism implies that wherever they intersect, they do so transversely. Nevertheless, it turns out that they intersect a lot, they, they accumulate on one another a lot, so that actually the closure of the stable manifold coincides with the closure of the unstable manifolds. So this required them to intersect a lot. And with a bit of work, indeed, you can show that the fact that they accumulate um, in this way forces the existence, in particular, implies the existence of all things, you know, separate traces. Now, the crux of the matter for this theorem is the equality between uh, this closure of stable and unstable manifolds, which unfortunately I won't be able to explain uh, in the talk. But perhaps I can just say that um, the crux of the matter is to establish that if we take a component of the asymptotic boundary and we assume that this component has a homoclinic, then the statement holds that stable manifold closure coincides with the closure of the unstable manifold. Now, so I won't explain this, unfortunately, but um, so I just remark, it looks like I'm biting my tail here because the goal of the theorem is to prove that there are homoclinics. And here I'm assuming that there are homoclinics and then I infer that this, this accumulation phenomenon, but turns out I'm not biting my tail in the same moment. Then second step, which is also not completely obvious, it requires a bit of work, but, but uh, it's a consequence of this accumulation is the following property. So assume you have two components of uh, your asymptotic boundary. If the two components are equal, what I'm about to say is straightforward. So assume that these two components both have homoclinics and uh, assume that there's a, there's a heteroclinic going from alpha to beta. So again, in this transverse picture, the hetero, this is the unstable manifold of alpha. This is the stable manifold of beta. And this is the heteroclinic point, which in the future uh, converges to beta and in the past converges to alpha. Now, if you are in this situation, it turns out that you also have a heteroclinic going backwards from beta to alpha, this point here. And the reason, the reason of this is that pretty much uh, the separatrix containing the, this heteroclinic point bends and intersects back the stable manifold of alpha, so it contains itself also homoclinic. So this given this separatrix contains the heteroclinic, also contains a homoclinic as a consequence of the of, of this statement. Now this is the second ingredient of the proof, and there's one more ingredient. The third ingredient is an argument, beautiful argument due to Walter Wittowski and Sander, um, that says that so they they proved it in the setting of finite energy foliations, but it's actually general arguments that applies to almost global surfaces of sections. So the argument says that if you take any component of your asymptotic boundary and any unstable separatrix, we call it P, this unstable separatrix contains a heteroclinic uh, towards some other um, component of the asymptotic boundary, perhaps the same gamma. So if it's the same, you found a homoclinic. And if it's not, it's an heteroclinic from gamma to another component of the asymptotic boundary. And so I stated this for the outgoing heteroclinics, but of course you have the same also for the incoming heteroclinic. So it would be for every, um, for every stable separatrix, there's an heteroclinic in, this, in that separatrix uh, going to be to gamma in the future and going to some other component or, or perhaps the same of the asymptotic boundary in the past. Right. So I know with these three points, I claim that um, the proof is pretty much over, or perhaps you just need uh, some standard uh, arguments from uh, hyperbolic dynamics, but very, very basic. So let me, let me explain. So um, take now, your given component gamma of the asymptotic boundary, the infinity sigma. And I'm going to consider, thanks to this uh, argument of over resource sender, heteroclinic sequences. So I consider an heteroclinic going out from gamma to uh, another 
component of the asymptotic boundary, and an heterogenic going towards gamma coming from another um, uh, component of the asymptotic boundary. Now, perhaps gamma minus one or gamma one are equal to gamma, and in that case, I found an homoclinic. But in general, they may be different components of the asymptotic boundary. If they're different components of the asymptotic boundary, I repeat the game, repeat and repeat. Since the asymptotic boundary contains only finitely many components because it's the boundary of a compact manifold, after a while, uh, this heteroclinic sequence must have the same orbit appearing twice in the future, say beta, and the same orbit appearing twice in the past. Okay, so this arrow means, once again, heteroclinics. And now we need just a little bit of uh, hyperbolic dynamics. So hyperbolic dynamics tells you that if you have transverse heteroclinics, in this case, all the heteroclinics are transverse because of the kupkas mayer condition. So if you have a transverse heteroclinic from one orbit to a second orbit, if you have another heteroclinic from the second orbit to a third orbit, you also have an heteroclinic from the first orbit to the third. It's pretty much a consequence of the either the lambda lemma or equivalently the shadow and lemma. So in this case, in particular, we have a homoclinic from alpha to alpha. We have an heteroclinic from alpha to beta. And we have a homoclinic from beta to beta. Therefore, we are in the setting of point two. And point two tells me that I also have an heteroclinic going from beta back to alpha. And therefore, overall, I have a heteroclinic from gamma to beta back to alpha and then forward to gamma. And therefore, I have a homoclinic from gamma to itself. And now, if I choose this first uh, heteroclinic from gamma to gamma one in the, in the unstable separatrix that I want, I can make this homoclinic in the unstable separatrix that I want. And therefore, I found homoclinics in every separatrix. So these are the steps of the proof. It just gives the, it's not the proof, but it gives the idea of the arguments that are needed. And although I didn't explain at all this argument here, perhaps if we have time at the end, I will say a little bit more. So now if, if let's say I'm gonna go with time, uh, I go is 35 minutes perhaps. I, I have 37 um, minutes, right? I think, right. Yes, it's something like. Yeah, it's good, it's good. Thanks. Um, so if there are no questions in this, then I move to the second part of the talk. And uh, perhaps some of you already heard this first part. And the second part, I, um, um, yeah, I, I spoke about the second part um, a few weeks ago in Paris, but perhaps for some of you, perhaps it was, it's, it's, it's not new, but, um, but I didn't like my talk in Paris. So explaining it a little bit differently now. Um, so, um, right, applications. So applications to, um, hyperbolic rep dynamics, and especially to geodesic flows. So I should say that we actually proved the applications before proving um, the existence of global surfaces of sections. And this is because in, actually the applications don't need global surfaces of sections. Almost global surfaces of sections are good enough for proving the applications. But I need almost global surfaces of sections at least. With global surfaces of sections, I can just simplify a small argument. But this simplification consists of the part of the arguments that I need to prove this coincidence of stable and stable manifolds pretty much. So, right, so applications. So applications to um, hyperbolic rep dynamics. So once again, I have the same setting as before. N is my closed contact free manifold, X the rep vector field, phi T the rep flow. I'm going to denote by per of X, the subspace of the closed rep orbits, which I see not as a subspace of the free loop space, as we often do in, in uh, syntactic dynamics, I see it really as a subspace of my closed contact free manifold. It's not necessarily closed. It's... So a consequence of the existence of uh, global surfaces of sections, or at least almost global surfaces of sections, is the following theorem that characterizes anus of rep flows. Or perhaps I should say, a rep flow is anosov when it's uh, hyperbolic in the sense of dynamics. So the dynamics around every point, you have uh, uh, you have directions in which if you, so you have nearby points that gets contracted. The, 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 so if you take a point Z, 
are nearby points z prime that in the future converge to the orbit of z. And there are nearby points that converged in the past. And this gives you a, a classical hyperbolic pictures in which you have a decomposition of your tangent bundle in stable subbundle and unstable subbundle. Everything is very, very classical. So uh, uh, red flow is called Anosov uh, when the old three manifold is hyperbolic for the flow. So the theorem is a characterization of Anosov uh, red flows. It says that um, a red flow is Anosov provided all the closed orbits are hyperbolic and a bit more uniformly hyperbolic. Namely, I want the larger of the space of periodic orbits, which is now a complex subset of my manifold, to be uh, hyperbolic. Uh, and, and then I want the Kupka smell condition, the transversality between stable and unstable manifolds. If these two conditions are satisfied, then the flow is answered. So, for instance, if I have Kupka smell transversality, which I have generically, and uh, if I have only finite many closed orbits which are all hyperbolic, then the flow must be anosov. And that gives me that the situation is impossible because the anosov flow has dense periodic orbits. This is an example of how to use this theorem. But um, so I would say the theorem is perhaps an interest per se, but for us, the interest was in, in, in uh, its applications to geodesic flows, which I'm going to mention uh, now. So let me apply this theorem in turn to geodesic flows. So I consider a Riemannian surface closed, Mg. And from now on, my closed three manifold, M, will be the unit tangent bundle of my closed Riemannian surface, Sn, instead of tangent vectors uh, of norm equal to one. Now, each unit tangent bundle, the unit tangent bundle carries a canonical contact form, canonically defined by the Riemannian metric. And the associated rep flow is the so-called geodesic flow. It's called like this because the orbits gamma of t are of the form x dot of t, so derivative of x, where x is a geodesic in the Riemannian surface that moves with speed one. So the closed geodesics of a closed Riemannian manifold, namely periodic geodesics, are the projections of the periodic orbits of the geodesic flow. And for now on, with, with a small abuse of, of terminology, I would call geodesics directly the orbit of the geodesic flow. There's no confusion, I think. And I'm also interested in elliptic closed geodesics, which are elliptic closed orbits of the geodesic flows. Uh, um, so a uh, uh, closed orbit is elliptic when its flow can multipliers are in the unit circle. And topologically, what happens is what I already mentioned before. If uh, you have a periodic orbit gamma that's elliptic, the nearby orbits wind around gamma. So they don't have to stay close to gamma for infinite time. Uh, they, perhaps they wind around a little bit and then they escape far away in the manifold. Um, but sometimes they do if you have a stable elliptic orbit, for instance. All right, so this is terminology, not a statement. So actually all this business started with this uh, beautiful theorem of Contreras and Oliveira from 2004, which was back in the time an, an application of the finite energy foliations of four progress of Kitzender that were introduced a bit before this theorem. that proved that uh, a C2 generic Riemannian metric on a two sphere, on a Riemannian two sphere has an elliptic closed geodesic. And our initial goal was to extend this theorem Closed surfaces of arbitrary genus, possibly also non orientable as well. And of course, the theorem, as it's stated, cannot hold uh, for arbitrary closed surfaces because you have, for instance, negatively curved closed, uh, closed surfaces. If you have a closed Riemannian surface of negative curvature, all the closed geodesics are hyperbolic. And if you perturb the metric in a C2 topology, you, you obtain a new metric which is still negatively curved and therefore still all the closure geodesics are hyperbolic. But what we could prove is that if you are, if you are given a Riemannian metric on a closed surface uh, with a suitable C2 small perturbation, either you create an elliptic closed geodesic, or if you're not able to, and then it's because the original geodesic flow was Anosov. Now, since I, I don't have much time, I, I, I decided not to 
write down this theorem specifically, but rather to write down a consequence of this theorem, which uh, is uh, significant, I believe. It's about the stability conjecture. It, the consequence is a confirmation of the stability conjecture for Riemannian geodesic flows. Let me remind some classical terminology, perhaps you're already familiar with it. So uh, let me remind the notion of structural stability for geodesic flows. So if you have a geode the geodesic flow of a Riemannian metric G, uh, this is C2 structurally stable within the Riemannian geodesic flows. If for any Riemannian metric G prime C2 close to G, there's a homeomorphism of the unit tangent bundle mapping closed orbit of the original geodesic flow to the closed, no, sorry, mapping orbits, not closed orbits or open and closed, mapping orbits of the original geodesic flows to the orbits of the new geodesic flow of G prime. Okay, so this is, so this homeomorphism doesn't need to be smooth, doesn't need to be a diff field. It doesn't need to preserve a parameterization. So this is the weakest uh, um, identification among dynamical systems possible. Now, um, the amount of characterization that I given in the previous slide implies um, the confirmation of a version of Pallis and Smale's stability conjecture for Riemannian geodesic flow flows. So the original conjecture was for general flows and it was established by Manier in the 1980s, but for the for genericity within the smaller class of Riemannian geodesic flow, it was an open problem. It's still an open problem in higher dimension. In dimension two, it's confirmed. So a C2 structurally stable geodesic flow of a closed surface must be Anosov. And this is an if and only if, because Anosov himself proved the converse. An Anosov, an Anosov flow is C2 structurally stable within the class of flows. Right, so let's see. So I have uh, 15 minutes left. And in the remaining time, I would like to explain the proof of the theorem in the previous slides, uh, the Anosov characterization of, um, so the, the characterization of Anosov red flows. And perhaps in the extra time, if you want, I can explain how it implies this corollary. It's, 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 um, that's not complicated. Ah, no, but before that, something really important. So for, um, so this theorem, if you, if you start working in the class of geodesic flows, you work in the class of Finsler geodesics, instead of working in the class of Riemannian geodesic flows, as I'm, I've been doing so far. So here I didn't write it anymore, but every time I write geodesic flow, I mean Riemannian. If instead you work within the larger class of Finsler geodesic flows, this theorem was famously proved by Newhouse in the 19, 70s, I believe. And uh, so now you may wonder, uh, Riemannian geodesic flows are a particular case of Finsler geodesic flows. Nevertheless, being generic within the class of um, geodesic flow is a much uh, stronger genericity um, than being, so something that is generic within uh, Riemannian geodesic flow is not necessarily generic within Finsler geodesic flows. So, let me mention Newhouse theorem is, uh, is an application, a highly sophisticated application uh, of the closing lemma for Finster geodesic flows or more generally Finster Hamiltonian systems. And for Riemannian geodesic flows, the closing lemma is a, a long standing open problem. So it's known in the C1 topology on the Riemannian metric, which, is the, which gives the C0 closing lemma in the geodesic flow. You know, C0 closing lemma looks very weak because if you have an orbit that almost closes up, perturb C0 the flow, you close it up. But here it's already hard because you want to perturb C0 the flow within the class of Riemannian geodesic flow. So this is possible. It's a theorem of uh, Rifard, but it's still very weak because it's in the, in the C0 topology. If you want the C1 topology on the flow, therefore the C2 topology on the geodesic flow, it's completely open. So our... Um, and of characterization is a way to avoid um, the, the closing lemma. So let me state, uh, let me, let me, so in the remaining time, 10 minutes, I, I believe, uh, let me sketch the proof of the Anos of characterization. So here is the theorem again. It's the same that I mentioned before. Let me read it again. So we have a closed contact three manifold. Uh, it's closed orbits are uniformly hyperbolic up to their closure. 
and the Kupka's male transversality holds. Stable and unstable manifolds of, uh, of the closed rebel orbits are transverse. Then there are flow mass bianos. The steps of the proof are, so the proof requires both some, requires both uh, compact geometry, almost global, uh, actually global surfaces of sections in the way I'm explaining it. Uh, it requires a bit of surface dynamics and it requires a bit of uh, hyperbolic dynamics. So first point of the proof is that under the first condition, if all periodic orbits are hyperbolic, which is uh, in particular what I'm assuming, then there must be infinitely many closed orbits. So Tehran is interested in geodesic flows, uh, the existence of infinitely many periodic orbits for geodesic flows of closed surfaces holds unconditionally. Uh, for surfaces of genus at least one, it's, sim it's easy. And for the two sphere, it's, it's a very difficult theorem due to a combination of results of Victor Bangert, uh, Nancy Hingston, or John Franks, and John Franks. Um, yeah, so in the rep setting, it's still true, and it's a combination, it's, it's for instance, an outcome of uh, results of Kolandor and Rekman and Christopher Gardner, Rinievich, Michael Hutchings, and Liu. So I have infinitely many closed rep orbits. And now I apply first bit of uh, hyperbolic dynamics. So I said the closure of the space of periodic orbits is a hyperbolic set. And uh, there's a theorem for hyperbolic dynamics, one of the foundational theorems that gives a so-called spectral decomposition. It says that the uh, uh, hyperbolic set, uh, this is local maximum. Uh, it, it's, it decomposes as a, a finite union of basic sets. So uh, basic set is a compact invariant subset that's uh, hyperbolic. It's uh, locally maximal, namely, if you take, for each of these lambda i, if you take a sufficiently small neighborhood of it, then lambda i is the largest invariant set contain, contained in the neighborhood. This is one way to say it. Uh, and, uh, and so basic set is uh, compact, locally maximal. It contains a dense orbit, so the dynamic is transitive. And uh, it could be, a, and it contains a dense subset of periodic orbits. So each of these basic sets, lambda i, may be, for instance, uh, a single closed orbit, hyperbolic closed orbit. Uh, however, as soon as you have in a basic set two closed orbits, then since you also have a dense orbit, you have actually infinitely many closed orbits inside. And every closed orbit is accumulated by closed orbits. Yes, it's one of the features of hyperbolic dynamics. So I have infinitely many closed orbits, and I have a decomposition in finitely many basic sets. Um, therefore, one of these basic sets, which I'm going to call lambda, at least one, must contain infinitely many closed web orbits. Now, this is a, in particular, I mean, hyperbolic set. My goal is to show you that uh, lambda is the old closed contact free manifold. And then the old closed contact free manifold is a hyperbolic set. That's precisely what Anosov means. So let's assume the manifold is not Anosov, and therefore lambda is not the old three manifold n. So lambda is contained in n, but it's different from n by contradiction. And now I need another ingredient from hyperbolic dynamic dynamics that's due to uh, Bowen and Ruel. So uh, Bowen and Ruel says that if you have a in this setting that the statement is stated in a slightly different setting, but in this setting, it would, it would uh, imply that if you have a basic set that's not the old three manifold, it must be a negligible set in your manifold. It must be a zero, measure zero subset of your closed three manifold. Um, this is pretty much because if lambda has positive, if lambda is positive uh, measure, then the stable manifold lambda is positive measure because it contains lambda. And Bowen and Rush shows that when the stable manifold is positive dimension, uh, the, the, um, the point is actually an attractor, meaning that uh, it has nearby points that are attracted to it. But also the unstable manifold is positive dimension. By applying the same reasoning, um, the unstable manifold is positive dimension, 
and therefore the point is a repeller. So the, 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 the set lambda is, is also a repeller. So you have an invariant subset that's both a repeller and, and an attractor. And uh, your manifold is connected. This lambda must be the old manifold. Very quickly, but, but uh, this is how it goes. So lambda is measure zero because it's not the old manifold. And from now on, things are going to get a little bit weird because we are inside the contradiction argument. And eventually, they become weird enough that you get a contradiction. So let's see. Um, so lambda is measure zero. Therefore, also the stable manifold of lambda is measure zero. This is because all the points in the stable manifold that are outside lambda, they are non-recurrent points because they converge towards lambda. And no recurrent point are zero measure subset by Poincare recurrence. So the union of the stable and unstable manifold is measure zero in your close contact three manifold. And so next, this is a little bit technical. Perhaps let me go, let me maybe not spend too much time on this. But so the local maximality of lambda that I explained before can be stated equivalently by saying that two sufficiently close points in lambda, we take two close orbits, so sufficiently close in lambda, they always have uh, homoclean, they always have uh, heteroclinic intersections among them, and all the heteroclinic intersections must be contained in lambda as well. That would be, uh, that would hold locally, and in this setting, the, the same things hold globally. So if you take an heteroclinic point from lambda to lambda, that point is contained in lambda itself. It's pretty much because lambda is a homoclinic, is a heteroclinic class. So perhaps I don't spend more time on this, but it's a simple technical point, not particularly delicate. And now I take a global surface of section, but I would be able to argue also with an almost global one. And I also have a few slides on that if eventually, but perhaps not. So it takes my I take my global surface of section, and now I fix a small heteroclinic rectangle. So what do I mean by that? I call it R. What is a small heteroclinic rectangle? So my lambda, my basic set, contains infinitely many closed orbits. And the boundary of lambda meets all the orbits. And the boundary of lambda is, contains only finitely many orbits. So this means that the interior of lambda must intersect, sorry, the interior of sigma must intersect lambda uh, in, in some periodic orbit. So I, I, I consider one periodic orbit in lambda that intersects my sigma at this point z. And since this periodic orbit is accumulated by periodic orbits, I take an another periodic orbit, which is very close to z. In the picture, they look far away, but you should imagine that this is a microscopic picture. Now, these two close orbits are very, very close. Therefore, the stable manifold of lambda and the unstable manifold of lambda must intersect. And uh, on sigma, um, stable manifolds and unstable manifolds must intersect in a way that we have four segments of stable and unstable manifolds that bound this rectangle. This is by definition an heteroclinic rectangle. So let's see, I have two minutes left. I promise I take perhaps three minutes more, but not more because we're almost done. Um, yeah, so now stable and unstable manifolds are not compact submanifolds of your three manifolds. They're open submanifolds, and they're very much open, meaning that at infinity, they fold and they fold in a complicated way. Nevertheless, on a small heteroclinic rectangle, uh, stable and unstable manifolds intersect the rectangle in a compact set. And basically, they intersect it in a set that's, that's a grid, like the one that I drew here. So in green, I drew the unstable manifold. In, in blue, the stable manifold intersect transversely. And so it's a compact subset of this rectangle. And I'm going to consider a complement of stable and unstable manifolds, a connected component of the complement of stable and unstable manifold in the heteroclinic rectangle. So I call it D, for instance, this one. It's itself an heteroclinic rectangle. It's bounded by these blue portions of stable manifolds and these green portions of unstable manifolds. And now, if I take, so notice that lambda doesn't enter D and the stable and unstable manifolds of lambda don't enter D by the way I define D. Nevertheless, Poincaré recurrence tells me that a generic point in D is recurrent. 
So I can find a D0 such that if I flow in the future, I get as close to the zero as I want. And in particular, if I flow in the future, I come back to the same rectangle D. Okay. And now, so now I have this correspondence from Z0 to Z1 given by the red flow for a certain that flows for a certain time. I remind you that this picture is on the global surface of section. So the flow flows out, eventually comes back to the surface of section within D. Now I extend the map from Z0 to Z1, a smooth return map Psi. It's perhaps not the first return map, but it's a smooth return map. Okay, so I'm writing again. Um, I'm recapping the situation here. I have my heteroclinic rectangle D. It doesn't contain stable and unstable manifolds of lambda, but it's bounded by portions of the stable and unstable manifold. And it has a point Z0 that returns under this return map. I'm almost done, promised. Now, I claim that the rectangle D is invariant under this return map. If you think about it, it's kind of obvious because uh, this boundary, this portion of the boundary in blue is the stable manifold. The stable manifold is invariant under the flow and the interior doesn't intersect the stable manifold. So this portion of the boundary cannot intersect the interior of D in the future. And so, so does, and then analogously, the, this, this green portion of the boundary, which is an unstable manifold, if you flow it forward, it never, inter it never intersects the, the, um, the interior of D. But the only way you can, uh, this can be realized is, is by, by having D preserved by Psi. Already things look weird here, and indeed, we, we immediately get a contradiction. Now we have a, a homeomorphism of an open disk that preserves the area form D lambda, the area, the, the, the differential of the contact form restricted to D. Now, it's a, the closure of D is compact, so the area of D is finite. So you can apply Brouwer translation theorem that tells you that any area preserving map of an open disk with finite area must have fixed points. But you found a fixed point of this return map, some Z prime that goes back to Z prime. That's that's a fixed point corresponds to a closed rab orbit that is close to the rab orbits that you have at the vertices of this heteroclinic rectangle. But therefore, since the, 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 the orbits in the vertices are in the uh, basic set lambda, which is uh, locally maximal, the new periodic orbit that you found must be in lambda as well, which is a contradiction because it intersects the interior of D and D doesn't intersect lambda. So it was perhaps a little bit fast, but that's the old proof. And uh, I think I can stop, stop here because I'm a bit over time. Sorry about that. Uh, th thank you very much, Marco. Um, so, uh, are there uh, are there questions uh, for, for Marco? Um, maybe I, I have a quick question. Uh, um, so uh, when you talked about uh, uh, C2 structure ability, you mentioned um, the, the, the Riemannian case, uh, which you have proven, and you mentioned the Kinsler case, which was proven by Newhouse. Yes. And my question would be like, uh, so where does symmetric Kinsler uh, uh, ah, yes. Uh, I don't think it's so. Yeah, actually, Knieper asked me the same question. Yeah, thanks for asking. So, um, we looked in the literature with uh, Gerard Knieper, and um, so the, the, the closing lemma for symmetric Finsel geodesic flows is so it's perhaps similar to the closing lemma of Finsel geodesic flows, but it's it's not written down in the literature. I would guess that it's similar because. Where Finster metric being symmetric is not too much to ask, but uh, the the closing lemma that for Finster geodesic flow is, is difficult, and uh, I cannot tell just by looking at the proof whether it goes through. If you require all the time that your Finster uh, metric is reversible and you only allow perturbation, that keep the reversibility. I don't know. It's uh, I mean, it's it's at least not written down. I would say it's open. 
I see, I see, I see. Uh, and but, you feel but then from, from, from your method, it, uh, it follows. Uh... Yeah, from my method doesn't need, uh, this my method, which is based on techniques of Contreras and Oliveira, this theorem that I explained, but based on the techniques needed to prove this theorem. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't require the closing lemma at all. I see. But, but it requires the surfaces of sections. Oh, by the way, I should say new house is in any dimension. So uh, if uh, if one has the closing lemma in higher dimension for ge Riemannian geodesic flows, it would also infer this stability conjecture in that dimension, in higher dimension. Uh -huh. okay. And if one, I would say if one has the closing lemma in CK topology, then uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that you would no uh, no 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 that perhaps that's not yeah so yeah going yeah the other problem would be to go from C two to C A for the stability conjecture and that's I I wouldn't be able to do because we yeah there are we we employ in the proof I didn't talk about how to infer this from the analysis of characterization but I need uh, a classical result which is called the Frank's lemma. The holes in the C two topology, but not in the in CK. So, I, yeah, I wouldn't be able to uh, worry for CK. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, are there are there any further questions? Um, so if there are no, uh, no further questions, I, I propose that we uh, thank Marco for his wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs>